Hey everyone, and welcome to the NCAST. I'm Guy Weissmantel, your host and Executive Vice President of Marketing here at NContracts. In this podcast, our subject matter experts from across the company will be talking with industry thought leaders about relevant topics and trends in compliance and risk management for financial institutions. You'll learn the latest tips and tools to manage risk in this ever-changing environment. Let's get started. Welcome. My name is Rafael De Leon. I'm the Senior Vice President of Industry Engagement for Encontrax, and I'd like to welcome you to today's podcast. Today's guest is Bruce Weinstein, also known as the Ethics Guy. Bruce is a practical, interactive, entertaining, in-person uh, presenter. He does a number of online video and courses on ethics. Uh, as I mentioned, he's known as the Ethics Guy, and you can find him at www theethicsguy.com. Bruce inspires leaders to do the right thing every time. He writes regularly, uh, he writes a column regularly on ethical leadership for Forbes magazine. His books include Ethical Intelligence, The Good Ones, 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees, and for kids, Is It Still Cheating If I Don't Get Caught? Bruce's clients around the world have included the Ford Motor Company, Marathon Petroleum Corporation, Society General, Mutabala Investment Company, and hundreds of other companies that know the key to their success is the high character of their employees, managers, and C-suite executives. I've gotten to know Bruce through his speaking engagements at banking associations, and we developed a friendship from just reaching out, and we both share the same hometown of San Antonio, Texas. So Bruce, welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you. Well, before we get into our topic on what is accountability, I'd really like you to kind of address where is it that bankers normally engage you and where do you usually address them and what are your thoughts on that? It's a great question, Raphael. It's usually the compliance department of a company that will have an ethics day or an ethics week. And so each year they're looking for a different ethics speaker and uh, they often like to bring somebody in from outside of the organization. So you mentioned that I spoke at Mubadala Investment Company in the United Arab Emirates. They had a compliance week, the same in Egypt and and Marathon Petroleum. Uh, But I think what's fascinating about that is, well, the, the upside is that it's an opportunity to talk about ethics from a fresh perspective. The downside is I think it it conveys the impression that ethics is a one and done thing, that it's just something that you need to look at one day a year or a week out of the year, and then, okay, I've got it, as opposed to being a, a daily, not struggle, but worth considering on a daily basis in overcoming challenges that we have. And so it, it's a good first step for companies to do this, to, to have a uh, an ethics day or ethics week, but it really it's not enough. I mean, companies spend lots of time looking at preventing sexual harassment, racial harassment, promoting diversity and inclusion. And that's, those are not one and done things. And by the same token, ethics should not be one and done either. So, you know, I, I totally agree with you. And I think there are some parallels we can draw from that with, you know, what our company does in terms of risk management. And again, risk management is like looking at ethics should be kind of a, a fluid process that is ongoing and continuously looking to adjust, readjust, monitor, reevaluate, uh, and assess because the path is always changing. And for me, one of the really good reasons that I wanted to have you on here is I think this ethical issues are really so important. And, and you bring up a good point. Why are they just done at discrete moments at banks? Is it done to check the box and all right, we've done this versus I see kind of ethics in a larger way. And again, I've got a number of courses back from my college days in philosophy as well. So I, I really kind of gravitate toward this. But I think in this day and age where we're seeing kind of a blurring of lines uh, of norms and ways ways that we do things, that ethical behavior is so much more important in a days when we're saying there's alternative facts or, you know, we can have kind of two sets of th- doing things. So ethics for me kind of gets down to what is it that I'm doing that's coming from within? How do you understand that? Uh, it, it's, it's a great question. And you may remember a couple of years ago, the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman wrote a piece about zombie ideas 
which he defines as an idea in politics or economics in his case, that should have died a long time ago, but continue to, to roam the earth. And so borrowing that metaphor, there are some zombie ideas about ethics that deserve to be sent to the cemetery for good, but they continue to walk the earth. For example, ethics varies from culture to culture. Absolutely incorrect. For example, several years ago, I was speaking to business aviators, pilots who fly C-suite executives around the world. And a member of the audience said, you know, the problem is sometimes when we go to countries where it's expected to bribe officials, our C-suite folks can't even get into the airport unless we pay off the officials at the airport. So there's an example of a practice that apparently is widespread, maybe except dead, but just because a practice is accepted doesn't mean that it is acceptable. Bribery, for this is a great issue where you know there are not right or wrong perspectives on this. There are not cultural differences. Bribery in the United States, in the United Arab Emirates, in Egypt, in Australia, it's wrong. There are some, of course, there are lots of ethical issues where reasonable people can disagree, but bribery is not one of them. So the practical implication of that is, well, if I just say no to bribing officials, I won't be able to do business in that country. Exactly. That's right. Did you ever see the movie Citizen Kane? Uh, years ago. There's a, a character in Citizen Kane. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's it's routinely listed as either the best or one of the best American films ever made. And it's about someone loosely modeled on William Randolph Hearst, somebody who values money above all else and ends up destroying his family and everyone he loves because of his pursuit of money and power. And one of his friends after Charles Foster Kane dies, I'm not giving anything away because you learn about that in the first scene, but one of his old friends says, you know, there's no trick to making a lot of money if all you want is to make a lot of money. And this is the problem with the zombie idea that ethics varies from culture to culture, because yes, making a profit is, is important. I mean, that we live in a capitalist society uh, uh, and much of the world is a capitalist world, but that doesn't mean that, that profit is the only important value. There are other values such as honesty, for example. And so for companies who, who want to honor all of the values that they claim to, to honor on their website, it might mean saying no to doing business with countries that require bribes. I, I think these are great topics. And, and before we get into the topic of accountability, there's there's one other question that, and I've heard you address this, and I'm going to ask you to address it again. What do you see as the difference between ethics and the law? It's, it's a great question. And good societies, good compliance professionals take the law very seriously. But for any law, we can and should ask, is it right? Is it fair? Is it just? And sometimes there are no relevant laws to speak of when we find ourselves asking, what's the right thing to do? For example, suppose I invite you, Raphael, to participate in a project where I could really benefit from your knowledge and skill, your expertise, your high character. But the problem is, unbeknownst to me, you have your plate is full already. In fact, it is overflowing. And, and I'm probably, I'm just guessing that that's probably true as it is for so many of us. We have more responsibilities than we can handle. If, if you take on another responsibility, if you say yes to me, will you be able to honor to the best of your ability, the responsibilities that you already have? Probably not. Probably not. So would it be legal for you to say yes to me? Yes, it would be legal. It would be legal. But would it be right? It, it probably wouldn't be right because you would not be honoring your obligations to people you've already made promises to. And that's one, I think, a, a rather commonplace example, or rather an example that a lot of us can relate to, of a practice that might be legally permissible and yet wrong. So I, I think I, I, without even having tried to set that up into moving into our main topic, I, I think that really just goes hand in hand. And you discuss that in your book, The Good Ones. Uh, of accountability, of uh, being if I'm overcommitted and I'm not honest with you. So let, let's jump into the topic. What is accountability? And share with me your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, before I break down what accountability is, I'd, I'd like to set it up by saying something that has surprised me the last couple of years, because one of the things I love to do before I speak to a group is to do a pre-conference survey and ask folks, for example, which of these 10 issues are you most interested in 
discussing since we probably won't have time to go into all of them. You mentioned the subtitle of that book, The Good Ones, is 10 Crucial Qualities of High Character Employees. So I, I just have, like on Serving Monkey, one of the questions just lists these 10 qualities, honesty, accountability, courage, uh, fairness, gratitude, and so on. And I would think that honesty would always be the top choice. And yet, over and over for the past several years that I've been doing this, not just in the United States, but all over the world, it's accountability that people want to talk about the most. And it's just fascinating to me that that's the thing. And when I've asked people, you know, if you had to choose one of the 10, why that one? And more often than not, it's the answer is along the lines of, I don't see a lot of it here. Or my supervisor is not walking the talk, and yet he or she expects me to do that. What, what that question does is it actually unleashes a lot of hidden anger that's out there. And in fact, at, at one organization, I showed the CEO the results of, of that poll and said, over and over, people here are saying that there's not enough accountability. And he, he actually was surprised to see that. He said, well, we have to take this seriously. So all I have to do is ask the question, what's most important to you? And then, then listen to the responses. And sometimes it's surprising what we hear. It's fascinating because um, uh, while I worked uh, for the OCC in my 32 years, I, I taught a number of leadership courses. And one of them that we were talking about, we started with our kind of C-suite officials and worked on down. And it was amazing to me. And while I wasn't in that position, I was still an individual contributor within the organization, but chosen to, to, to speak on this topic. I was always amazed at how many people said, those above me aren't doing it. And, and my reaction to that is, uh, yes, I, I get that and I see that and how that comes down, but I can't control those behaviors. What I can control is me. And, and so how do you discuss that then with people when they keep saying leadership at the top is not doing that? I know people have to walk the talk and it has to be modeled and, and culture and, and organizations with strong cultures and strong ethics, it is modeled from the top. It's, it's very visible. But share with me your response on that. It's a great question. And the thing is, if you're seeing the same problem coming up over and over again from employees in different workplaces with respect to the same organization, it does raise a red flag. And yet, as you, I think what you're getting at is it's always easy to point fingers and say it's that person that's to blame. But here's the thing. I think ethics is really misunderstood as something that is an attempt to help bad people become better, good ones, or it's usually presented as a list of thou shalt nots. You know, don't do this horrible thing or you'll be punished. But the way I look at it, and I know that you look at it the same way because we've talked about this before, it's really about helping good people making the best possible choices. So even if one is in a system, an organization where there are problems beyond yourself, it still behooves all of us to do the best we can. But the thing is, if the problem is so systemic and if the, the leadership is not taking it seriously, then there's another question that comes up, which is, why are you even going to stay here? If the problems are that deeply embedded, if the senior leadership does not take ethics seriously and, and it's crushing you uh, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, why stick around? There are other options. I know it's not always easy to, to jump ship, but it really has to start at the top. No, I agree. And you bring in really two good parallels. You know, when, when we're speaking to a lot of compliance officers ourselves, compliance officers always, you know, see themselves and or the rest of the organization sees the compliance area as these are the no people. These are the people that tell me I can't do things. And I try to reframe that to say, no, the compliance people are really making sure that you are following the objectives that the board of directors has set forth and said, this is how we want to manage our institution and within these guidelines. And yet a lot of people get caught up in the excitement of, well, I, let me go after this deal and I could bring in this deal. I, I've seen in, in you know banks where all of a sudden, you know, I know somebody and we can help finance the airplane. It's no big deal. Well, what particular expertise do you have in airplane financing and why is this there at the bank? So you bring up good points for that. And then the second point you bring up is right now there's a 
you know, really a war for talent. Uh, so you bring up a good point that that people who are good at their jobs can go find other jobs and situations. And why would an organization want to maybe not a consciously shoo people away or encouraging people to leave because of ethical behavior? So what does it usually take to to get underneath? Is it surveys like you're doing? Is, is it Gallup surveys? What is it? Well, I, I'd want to expand on a point you just made, which is that it is in an organization's own financial interest to keep the best and the brightest of them at the organization. So, you know, we ask why care about ethics? Why care about doing the right thing? Well, it's right for its own sake, but it also turns out to be a good business move. I mean, do you really want uh, your high character, the, the, the deeply committed, honest, accountable people to leave because not because they're not being paid enough, but because of, of the corruption or the culture at the organization, isn't it? Wouldn't you rather change the culture rather than have to spend the time and money to bring new talent on board? It just from a finance, I mean, forget about ethics for a second. That may sound strange for someone calling the ethics guy to say, but just putting ethics over to the side now, just from a financial point of view, it's in your own interest to take this seriously. No, I, I agree. What's in it for me? That's the question I think that people want to know. Right. And uh, I think that's what it boils down to when when people can see it from a different perspective. So let, let's get into the issue of accountability and how you see that and how that applies. What I would like to kind of talk about from the institution to the self. Yes. Accountable people do four things consistently. First, they keep their promises. Second, they consider the consequences of their actions. Third, they take responsibility for their mistakes. And fourth, they make amends for their mistakes. At the beginning, I said that accountable people do this consistently. Does that mean that to be accountable means you never, ever break your promise? Of course not. My wife, who's a compliance professional, by the way, likes to say, uh, we can't be perfect, but we can always be good. We can always try to be good. We can always try to do better. And I think we might even think about this as aspirational in a sense that however well we keep our promises, can't we always do a better job of it? And in fact, of all the, and I talk about this, in fact, I was just in Texas the other day talking about this, that keeping promises is my personal struggle, not because I don't intend to keep the promise when I make it, but I, I don't always do a good job of saying, well, let me check my calendar first before I make this commitment to you, because at the time, you know, it seems like a, a great opportunity and I want to please the other person, but um, it really does make sense to check one's calendar before making a commitment. And so for me, and perhaps for some of your listeners as well, uh, the challenge is to resist the impulse to make promises that we're not prepared to keep. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with you there. And again, as I've spent a lot of time talking, thinking about how we would frame this discussion, I had to kind of reflect on my own behaviors. And again, that is that challenge. And it's difficult also being here at a new company, not being able to kind of weigh all the responsibilities, all the different directions that I'm going to get hit on versus I'm coming out of a 32-year career. I pretty much knew the job and how I could manage those things. It was much easier. And I do find myself failing and keeping those promises. Oh, when I said I'm going to get something to somebody, or it's not the quality I would have liked to have gotten to somebody. And Wait, so it, let me ask you this though, because you, we both now talked about shortcomings of ours. When you just mentioned that just now about how this has prompted reflection and you recognize that you could do a better job, but is that hard or easy for you to say publicly something like that? It is gotten easier with age and where I'm at in my career, I can honestly say that, uh, you know, but again, I find that I am able to be at a different point in life to be honest and reflective and really want to try to do better. When you were talking about these behaviors and I had to go back and examine mine that we're not all perfect. I had to look at my struggle in terms of uh, working out and losing weight. You know, I went from losing quite a bit at one time. And what I realized, it is it is not a one-day event. It's not a two-day event. It's not 90 days for the next uh, big event that I'm going to attend. 
These are lifestyle choices. And so in those lifestyle choices, there's days that I'm going to eat things that I probably don't normally eat. And then I realize, like, did that make me feel any better or not? And it's the same thing about those choices when there's another side of the, the consequences of failing to keep promises of uh, that it starts eroding trust. And that, you know, when that trust is eroded, and especially in a relationship, you wonder, well, can I really trust what they're saying? Yes, Are they yes, going yes. to be able to keep up this deadline versus, you know what, let me get back to you and give you a more honest assessment or what I used to tell people that were working for me. I did not want to know at the nth hour, you couldn't get something done. If you realize, and it's a week out or two weeks out, Hey, I'm not going to be able to get this finished. Here's where I'm at. These are the struggles I'm encountering. This is what I'm dealing with. This is my schedule. And these things have happened, whatever they are, let me know then. But I don't want to know the day before or the day of the dog ate my homework. Like, we, you know, like we used to do as kids at school. Exactly. And perhaps that one thing all of us could do a better job of doing and maybe having organizations promote this is the willingness to be vulnerable, to say, I need help, uh, that I, I'm sorry, I made a promise that I can't keep, but I'm giving you enough uh, warning so that maybe we can find another way of solving it rather than to deny that there's a problem and pretend that we have everything uh, under control when we don't. Because I, I mean, when you talk about, I don't know if you use the word shortcoming, but as 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 people in corporate America like to say, opportunities for development, right. it, it does take a certain amount of courage to do that. But it maybe gets a little bit easier the more we do it, that we find that, in fact, this is actually one of my favorite stories of all. Uh, a couple of years ago, an engineer, I was speaking to 95 senior engineers at a privately held company's annual meeting. And one of the gentlemen stood up and said that he made a mistake on a project and it was going to delay the delivery of the project by months. But he knew he had to tell the client, although he was afraid he would be fired or thought of poorly. But the client really surprised him because once this engineer told the truth about what was going on, the client said, Thank you for your honesty. I am so impressed that you had the courage to be honest that not only am I not going to fire you, when we're done with this project, I'm going to give your company another project worth $3 million. And two different engineers in two different groups I spoke to that year told the same story. It's fascinating that sometimes we can draw a direct line from, say, honesty and courage on the one hand and a quantifiable financial benefit to the other. So here there was a literal a literal payday for this person having the courage to be vulnerable to to admit to making a mistake. Not we can't always do that. There's not always a quantifiable outcome. There's not always a benefit, but sometimes there is. So for a lot of our audience as, you know, community financial institutions, smaller financial institutions, I really feel for the compliance officers and risk officers who have these mandates and these schedules to get done. You know, you've got the regulators looking at it. You've got the board and C-suite looking at it. Why isn't this getting done? And what is this getting done? And yet for most companies now, they're asking people to do more with less. And again, so software and other systems really kind of help in those processes, but it, it is now that we're having more talks about vulnerability, those that can honestly go up without, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to get fired or, you know what, I bear the responsibility. I said I was going to do this and I can't manage to get all these review yes, done. Yes. yes. In fact, the other day I, I admitted something I never told anyone, and I don't even think I've told my wife this, but I was talking about why there are several good reasons not to tell trivial lies. And one of the reasons not to do so is the damage it can do to our reputation, even a lie with low stakes. And I just decided to tell this group that last year I was serving on the board of directors of a nonprofit and I was the secretary and the president asked me if I had done something yet that I said I was going to do. And I lied. I told him that I had when I hadn't. And he looked at me and this is a, someone who's a friend of mine. I've been friends with him for over 10 years. He looked at me and I knew by the look on his face that he knew I was lying and it didn't destroy our friendship. We're still friends. We're still colleagues. But there was that look of betrayal in his eyes. And I, I thought, like, this is just awful. It would have been so much better if I had just said, Jay, I'm sorry, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. I'll do what I can to make up for it rather than to lie about it and to see 
that that I had put a, a dent in the trust that I built up with him. It was horrible. Right. Well, the other way that I've kind of handled those situations is going back, even if I may have said yes or or been incorrect or, or you know, lied in that point and going back and saying, because it's just kind of being caught in the moment, like, oh, yeah, I've got this done. And then going back and, and owning up to it yeah. and, and, you know, going back and kind of looking at some of the other qualities we're talking about there. So we're talking, we've ta- spent a lot of time talking about keeping promises. Let's talk about the consequences. I think that in my mind, they're kind of laid out, but how do you talk about the consequences when you're looking at these qualities. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever written a text or responded to an email in anger and then sent it? Yes. And I've gotten and it, much better about not hitting send now of actually typing it and getting it off my chest. But I have, I've been guilty of that. And so, and I see that Gmail now allows you to recall an, an email, but I think you only have 20 seconds to do it. It's not a, it's not a great window. And I think some other email uh, servers allow you to do that as well. But this, I think, is one of the, the great promises and downsides of technology, which is that it allows us to communicate more quickly than ever. But if we if we allow our emotions, especially anger, to shape what we do, then I mean, I think we're more likely to say, I regret sending that rather than saying, oh, I'm so glad I sent that. Yeah. Had we had we just just cooled off for a, a moment, an hour, or just waited overnight, and you read it the next day and think, oh, oh, why did I, I can't believe I sent this thing? Um, and then once it's out there, it's out there for good. And, and in the book, I talk about a woman named Kelly Blazik who sent a really nasty email to someone who reached out to her on LinkedIn, and the young woman who received it was so upset that she uh, sent it out to. Reddit and some other social media, and it became an international news story that almost destroyed this woman's career. And all she had to do, and in fact, the story is a little murky ethically because what the woman on the receiving end, the woman on the receiving end wasn't flawless in in her behavior either, but she certainly didn't do anything on the level of what this, I forget the way she described herself in, I think it's in Cincinnati, but yeah, she was kind of like a, a mother of kind of helping yeah. find jobs or something like yes, that. Yes, yes, uh, she yeah. yes, the mother of uh, helping people find jobs, and you know it is annoying. I think when we get a request out of the blue on LinkedIn for help, when especially when uh, it it's just a, a what can you do for me kind of email. So one can understand why Kelly Blazek would have been maybe a little ticked off at getting a request like this out of the blue for for help. But to respond in the way she did, when you read the response, you think this person was really having a bad day. And, and by the way, I do want to come back to this issue of foul mood and, and ethics, but we'll put that aside for now. And, you know, it's really a shame that remember that movie Diamonds Are Forever? Yes. We're, we probably saw it at the same cinema in San Antonio <laughs> when it came out, right? I think at the Almas, it was on a triple feature right. with Thunderball and You Only Live Twice. In any case, it's not just diamonds that are forever. It's the Internet. And the, the nasty gram that this woman sent in haste is now on the internet for all to see forever, or as long as as long as we remain a planet. And that's unfortunate because you know you make one mistake like this and you end up paying for it for the rest of your life. So you you bring in a really good point, to kind of tie in with with our audience in terms of what do you see on those? Let's talk about the consequences for financial institutions for the difference between violating the law or unethical behavior and you know what's going on there we've seen a number of scandals that that have happened there's been the the barclays libor scandal and how people were involved in that we've seen wells fargo you know opening up accounts and yet there's people in the middle of that that are caught in that that are asked to do something Let, let's talk about the consequences for these financial institutions well let's say that you were an employee at wells fargo and you were being directed to create ghost accounts and it, you either did it. I mean, really, the choice was you do this or you don't work here any longer. Well, and unfortunately, when that happened, there weren't the job opportunities then that there are now. Nevertheless, if you have to choose between doing something unethical and, say, feeding your family, it's a very difficult choice. But for fortunately, for a lot of us in this community that we're talking to now, the dilemma is not that stark that somebody asked to do something blatantly unethical and illegal like that can and should say, I can't do this in good conscience. I can't do it. I won't do it. And if enough people said no, just like if enough 
company said, we're not going to do business in companies where bribery is, is expected. If enough companies said that, then those bribing officials would have to think of another way of getting business into the country. So I've talked to, and again, a number of compliance officers and risk officers who were really trying to build good you know, risk models and, and assessing risk within a company. And they, they, they feel like they keep getting beat down by their own management. No, just do X, Y, and Z. Don't do this, do this. And they're wanting to do more, go over and beyond. And when I hear that, both from the side as a, a former regulator and also on this side looking at it, but just as a human, that those are challenges that people face day in and day out. And, and I get, think it gets down to what you said, how do I choose to live within that? Or what other choices do yes. I have to make? And what's ironic about the unethical request that you're talking about is I'm, I would venture to guess that in every single one of those cases, if you were to look at the value statement of the company where the senior leaders are making these demands of risk managers or compliance professionals, if you look at their value statement, those values argue against doing those kinds of things, right? The senior leaders who are making these demands of compliance officers, uh, risk managers are violating their own company's value statement. Right. But the no. problem is if you were to do a quiz of, of the management or actually all the employees at an organization and say, just quickly off the top of your head, what are the values that our, our company espouses? What percentage of folks would be able to even say what they are? A very low number, which tells me that for too many companies, values are just words that you put up on the screen. They're, right. just, they're just words on the homepage of the website or buried deep in the bowels of the website. They're you know, just that, words. Right. No, there's been a number of good examples I've read on that. Uh, and, and one of the things that I've, I've talked about and now being a on a board of a bank, the issue that I would talk about as an examiner was the issue of credible challenge. How is the board being a credible challenge to management? What are the types of questions that they're asking? Mm. But I, I think there's also- I that like that a lot. I like that a lot. It's a credible challenge. Where do you kind of stand up? And I think that's where I kind of, I like to offer to risk managers, did I bring this up? Did I do my best to do that? Did How was I a credible challenge to say, just do X, Y, and Z? Yes, but we can do these other things and do a much better job as a, as a company, how we're going to act responsibly. Well, what you're suggesting, I think, and rightly so, Raphael, is that the senior leadership should be beholden to the board of directors, not the other way around. Right. And yet too often we see that the board is, is afraid of the senior leadership and kowtows to it. And the consequence is usually not very good. And they become the stuff of stories. No, no, definitely, leaders. definitely. So I think th those are those issues in terms of, you know, uh, being a credible challenge uh, before people start realizing the consequences and, and making sure that those issues are heard. We can go back to, I remember the issues around the, the space uh, shuttle Challenger and the kind of the O-rings that, yes. you know, all of a sudden yep. people were bringing up in the, within the rank and file saying, these things are going to work. These things, are, well, you know what? We're not, we need to get this done. We've got these other commitments. We're going to do this. And the end result, the consequence was death and destruction. That can never be reversed. That's actually a, a plot line in this wonderful series on HBO called Succession, where one of the characters, it, it's clearly a reference to the Challenger disaster because one of the, the people at the company behind it rams the decision to go forward with the, the launch through the uh, protocol and it's done prematurely and there is a disaster. So it, it really, but I think what you're talking about, speaking to, back to our issue of vulnerabilities, it takes humility for senior leaders to say, you know what, maybe we should listen to people who are warning us, even though they're in a different position in the hierarchy, but they know better than we do what's going on with this. Right. But it, it does take humility, don't you think? That to uh, I, I, I agree. To that? And, and I'll share with you an example of, you know, uh, within my first week of starting with end contracts, the CEO who values this and has talked about uh, the uh, being humble and, and humility really demonstrated this early on. He told me before a conference call, he asked me to join him on. I'm kind of worried about you being on this conference call. And I was like, why are you worried about me being on this conference call? He's like, because if I say something wrong in front of a regulator or former regulator, and I'm just as worried on the other side that I'm not going to have the answers to things he might be looking for me. <laughs> and I shared that with him. But just that little bit of demonstration 
changed the course of how I saw things with him and within our organization. And I'll bet that uh, at that discussion that you were about to have, you did not see yourself as a former regulator. Oh. You were right. That wasn't how you saw yourself, but that's how, if not the world sees you, uh, how this uh, CEO saw you. I saw myself as a new employee. Right, you know, right, right. And, and wanting to do the best job and afraid, like, am I going to be, be able to live up to the expectation? But the idea that we're we're going to be vulnerable to one another, we're going to expose our, our weaknesses. I think that's what you and and he were, were doing. You were admitting what you were afraid of. Right. And, and uh, there's very few opportunities that we have in this. And I think, again, you know, there's been a lot of talk of vulnerability and, and how we display that. Uh, a lot of podcasts, Brene Brown, and certainly in her research and, and talks that she's done. But I think those are really key in terms of leveraging for everyone, myself included, how we do that. And it's okay to do that. Well, not um, only is it okay, but I think we respect other people more when they do that. And I suspect that well, I know you just said, actually, that you respected the CEO more after he did that. And then he respected you more for your opening up that way. Right. right. Obviously, there's a limit to how much you can do this, but we're far from having to worry about doing it too much. Right. So we've talked about two of these components. So when you look on at accountability of keeping promises and consequences, let's talk about taking responsibility. We, you know, I think, again, how would you frame it? How do you talk well, about it? I always ask audiences to vote anonymously. Taking responsibility for a mistake is a sign of strength. And what would you guess the percentage of people who say that it is a sign of strength is, uh, generally speaking? In the several years I've been doing this, it's close to or at 100%, oh, wow. which is fascinating to me because if so many people believe that taking responsibility and owning up to a mistake is a sign of strength, why don't why do we see so many shortcomings in this area? Too many people may say they believe that it's a sign of strength. When it comes to having to do it, we say, you know what? I don't think I want, I don't want people to dislike me. I don't want people to think I'm a jerk. And so, so we don't do it. And yet to your point about accountability, accountable professionals, accountable compliance executives, professionals, accountable risk managers can and must take responsibility for their mistakes. It just, it's part of the job description, isn't it? Right. Well, let's say it should be part of the job description, but it is not. And one of the things that I've been doing for the last couple of years is helping companies rewrite their job descriptions because I'll every single, I, I'm going to guess almost every single person listening to this, if you take a look at the job descriptions your company is running, not just in the compliance and risk management departments, but everywhere, it's an obsessive focus on two things, knowledge and skill. All the things you have to know, all the things you have to be able to do. How many times do we see references in a job description in compliance, risk management, anywhere? How many times do we see references to the company's values? Almost never. Almost never. Does that so, make sense to you? It, no, it makes no it, sense to me. No, no, it, it makes total, total sense. And, and again, I kind of wrote down here on my notes. KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities are what people are typically focused on. And you bring up a good topic, and it was something I, I did want to bring up in here. So a lot of us have to hire people. We're sitting through things. How do you assess or evaluate accountability or a person's accountableness during an interview? If I'm wanting to hire somebody, what suggestions would you yes. have for me? So if I were hiring you to work for the Ethics Guy LLC or the Institute for High Character Leadership, I would say, uh, tell me about a time when you kept a promise that was difficult for you to keep, but you did it anyway. What happened? I do like to ask questions when they're character-based questions. I do like to ask questions where there's a good outcome, where something good happened, because too often I think it can feel like, oh, they're looking to trip me up. They're, they're looking for me to e expose how weak I am or how low character I am or whatever it is. When in fact, what I uh, what I do like to see is how having the courage to say, tell an uncomfortable truth or to keep a promise, how it can lead to a good thing. People love to tell those stories. We just have to ask for them. So if I wanted to evaluate your commitment to keeping a promise, I might ask for something like that. Or if it's about uh, taking responsibility, tell me about a time when you took responsibility for a mistake you made. And if I knew that you led a team, I would say, have you ever taken a responsibility for a mistake a team member made? Tell me about that. 
No, um, I, and it just kind of prompted the questions in my mind because I've been in those situations. Of how do you do that during an interview? And I usually ask somebody, you say, tell me about a goal you set. And it wasn't until you articulated that that I'm really trying to get it that same way. I'm not, I don't really care of how many times you stopped and started. Tell me about the journey. That's the important thing there. Exactly. And a question like that, since people are not used to being asked questions like that, and it throws people for a loop, there's nothing wrong with saying, I have one, I just need to think about it. Can I get back to you tomorrow? Right. And and then also, though, for people listening to this who are on the market and are looking to put themselves ahead of their competition, I encourage you to offer the answer to that question at your job interview, even if you're not asked it and you won't be asked it. Offer because you want to show your putative employer, your future employer, that you're not only smart, that you're not only skilled, you're a person of high character. You're an accountable person. And here's the evidence of it. And I'm going to offer it to you, even though you didn't ask me for it. So, Bruce, let me, as, as we're uh, kind of pressing on time, but uh, wow, one, that, it's, we're just getting started, man. I know we could spend up. some more and, and maybe we could do a follow up series on this. You and I have talked about this before, and I would love like to it. kind of draw this out some more. But what advice would you have for financial institutions that want to commit to ethical business? It, it, it's a great question. And it starts with, well, I would say that there are four steps. There are four steps to, to building and creating, building and keeping an ethical culture, building and keeping an A-team. There are four steps. And in fact, I put these four steps into a, a mini book, a, a paperback book that's 16 pages. And uh, anybody listening to this who wants it, they, if they just write to me, I'll, I'll mail it to them. I'll even pay for the postage. Or I can send a PDF, whatever you prefer. Yeah. But uh, just quickly, the four steps are first, you have to declare your values to the world. And the way you do that is by putting references to those values on the homepage of your website. For a lot of folks listening, those values that, that their company espouses are buried deep in the website. Maybe you click on about us and then you have to click on mission statement or value statement. And wouldn't you agree, Raphael, in this world, in today's world, two clicks is two clicks too many. No one has time to do that. No one's going to do it. It should be right there above the fold, along with the products and services you offer. Number yeah. two, yeah. you have to notify job applicants of the values they must uphold. And that means embedding references to your values in every single job description. This is going to take longer than the first one, because the first one, the IT folks can, can do in 20 minutes. But this, what I'm suggesting now means combing through every single job description you have out there and the ones you're putting out there to make sure that there's not only references to knowledge and skill, but to your company's values. The third thing is to hire for character as well as competence. And we do that by asking some of the questions like the ones I just asked you. And the fourth is to share your success stories. We've talked about some already like that. That When I, oh, for example, that that engineer who talked about how he landed a $3 million contract just by telling the truth. There were 95 of his colleagues from across the country, all of whom knew this fellow. In this room, I said, please raise your hand if you've heard, I'll call him Jeff. Please raise your hand if you've heard Jeff's story before. One hand went up, one hand. And it was the it was uh, Jeff's business partner, his engineering partner who raised his hand. And I said to the group, does it make sense to you that one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard and that maybe you've ever heard is this company's best kept secret? This should be well known to everyone. And there's a there's a way of sp not spinning it, but presenting it so that it doesn't look like, well, yeah, hire us because our, our employees uh, make mistakes. No, it's about how, how our employees care so much about doing the right thing. This is what they're willing to do, to have the client testify on camera saying, this is why I give this company so much business because I trust their employees. And here's an example of it. Right. That should be shared with the world. No, absolutely. I think, again, you've given really good, solid steps and advice in terms of looking at uh, how companies can demonstrate their ethics, uh, how they can demonstrate their values, and uh, on the steps that we're talking about on accountability. I've learned a lot today. And again, I learned a lot. You know, we continue our dialogue and our friendship. I would like this to see if we could uh, evolve into other sessions where we kind of break down dis discrete portions. As you said, we're just getting started. But again, I know a number of bankers have heard you out there. You've spoken to a number of different banking organizations in addition to the list that I had gone through on your bio. So any closing thoughts today? 
Yes. First of all, I would encourage anyone listening to this who has a question for us to address in a future episode to send it to you. And we can, you know, we can open the the next episode with uh, our take on this question, whatever it happens to be. And the second is I did offer this book called High Character Banking, Four Steps to Success. So if you want the, the paperback version or the PDF, just write to me through my website, theethicsguide.com, and mention that you heard this discussion on End Contracts podcast, and I'll send it to you. And just, if you want the paperback, just let me know where I should send it. I'm not going to put you on a mailing list. I don't, I don't like it when people do that. (laughs) Well, good. I have that, I have that booklet. That's uh, when we first met and started our conversation. So I, I I think it, uh, it was a great reward to be able to meet you and have this discussion today. So, Uh, you know, uh, I was at the American Bankers Association and I felt, I loved, it was great, a great honor to present to 900 banking CEOs from around the country. I felt a, a bit straitjacketed because I love to have a discussion like what we're having with mics in the audience, maybe me with a handheld mic going into the audience. But I wasn't, you know, for the time constraints and just the way the auditorium was set up with 20 minutes, I had to just stay put and speak for 20 minutes. The last time I spoke for 20 minutes without any audience interaction was at my bar mitzvah in San Antonio, I might add. And I don't like to I don't like to speak like that because it should be more of a town hall discussion, not a lecture. So it was really great to meet you after that presentation and con- connect and feel like, oh, you know, I, I, there now I can have some back and forth with, with the audience because I wasn't able to have that on stage. No, definitely. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, everyone. That wraps up another great episode of the NCAST, where we are able to talk with people on the front lines of risk and compliance across the financial services industry. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you're not subscribed yet, we invite you to do so on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you soon.